You do know that there's always things going on behind the scenes, don't you? There's always behind the scenes workers. I mean, it's not just this two of a DVD or the special features on a Blu-ray. I mean, there are behind the scenes people in just about every phase and purpose of this world. If we're talking about a major corporation, there are face people, figureheads, but then there's the people behind the scenes that make the corporation the success it is. At your workplace, all throughout the world, there are people that are invisible to the majority, but they make things happen and they are vitally important. Just consider Klondike Baptist, the building, for just a minute. People spend hours each week vacuuming, sweeping, mopping, cleaning toilets, cleaning bathrooms, reloading the paper towel, soap, and toilet paper dispensers, changing light bulbs, cleaning, polishing pews, putting back the music books, the pew Bibles that are all out of place, pulling trash, candy wrappers, leftover bulletins, gum wrappers out of the pews, dusting, spending hours cutting the grass, weed eating, taking care of the cemetery, watering plants, picking up trash out Side, refilling candy jars, making the children's bags, purchasing donuts, making the coffee, setting up, tearing down, building maintenance, and many, many more things, all behind the scenes, all invisible to your eyes, so that you can come comfortably on Sunday morning and have a place that looks nice to worship. Now, those people are invisible to you, but without their contribution, their time, collectively, this place would be a disaster. No matter how good the music was and how strong the preaching was, not many people would want to be here because of what it would look like. Behind the scenes people are vitally important. And that is exactly what I want to talk to you about today. I want to talk about something invisible to many, but something that is vitally important to each one of you this morning. I want to speak on the invisible war that is going on. Despite the current surge of interest today in the world and in the occult and New Age beliefs, Satanism, there is still a shocking ignorance on the part of Christians and really the world and people everywhere as to this war that is raging. Now this is not a flesh and blood war. It's not a political party war or even an ideology or human agency war, even though all those different groups may have already taken a side. This war, though it's not physical, the enemies are just as real as any enemy that has ever wielded a sword, wielded a gun, or given a speech. Though invisible, these forces are dedicated to our destruction. And they operate under the authority of one who is the father of lies and the prince of darkness. Sociology, political science, stand baffled at the face of the world's evil, at the war that is raging in this world, the darkness. And yet, Scripture tells us very clearly that there are, quote, rulers, authorities, and cosmic powers and spiritual forces, Ephesians 6, at work, all invisible to the human eye, but yet influencing this world. You see, friends, Scripture tells us that Satan has engaged in heavenly warfare that directly affects nations and generations, turning people and nations against God. This angelic supernatural warfare and conflict may be invisible to your eye, but it influences leaders. It influences policies. They are after our world. They are after our nation. To get a little more personal, they're after our church. They're after your family. They're after your children. They're after you personally. If you have ever felt like your family is under attack, or that you personally have been under attack, you very well may have been. And I think Daniel chapter 10 shows us this invisible war, but it also shows us how to defeat them. Wouldn't you like to know the answer to how to defeat them? How to change things in your family, change things in your life, even change things in our church. Read with me Daniel chapter 10, verses 1 through 18, and then we will pray and seek the Lord's help in understanding this invisible war. Scripture says, In the third year of Cyrus, the king of Persia, a message was revealed to Daniel, whose name was called Belteshazzar. The message was true, but the appointed time was long. And he understood the message and had understanding of the vision. In those days I, Daniel, was mourning three full weeks. 
I ate no pleasant food, no meat or wine came to my mouth, nor did I anoint myself at all till three whole weeks were fulfilled. Now on the 24th day of the first month, as I was by the side of the great river, that is the Tigris, I lifted my eyes and looked, and behold, a certain man clothed in linen, whose waist was girded with gold of Uphaz. His body was like barrel, his face like the appearance of lightning. His eyes were like torches of fire. His arms and his feet like burnished bronze in color, and the sound of his words like the voice of a multitude. And I, Daniel, alone saw the vision, for the men who were with me did not see the vision. But a great terror fell upon them. So they fled to hide themselves. Therefore I was left alone when I saw this great vision, and no strength remained in me, for my vigor was turned to frailty in me. I retained no strength. Yet I heard the sound of his words, and while I heard the sound of his words, I was in deep sleep on my face, with my face to the ground. Suddenly a hand touched me, which made me tremble on my knees and on the palms of my hands. And he said to me, O Daniel, man greatly beloved, understand the words that I speak to you. Stand upright, for I have now been sent to you. While he was speaking this word to me, I stood trembling. He said to me, Do not fear, Daniel, for from the first day that you set your heart to understand and to humble yourself before your God, your words were heard. And I have come because of your words. But the prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me twenty-one days. And behold, Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me. For I have been left alone there with the kings of Persia. Now I have come to make you understand what will happen to your people in the latter days. For the vision refers to many days yet to come. Let us pray. Oh Lord, we need your help to understand your word today. This is not necessarily an easy passage, but every word of God is pure and true. And we recognize that there is a war that is going on, and this passage gives us truths about that war. And Lord, I am concerned for our church. I'm concerned for the families of our church, for the children of our church, for the individuals who make up the body of Christ here. Oh God, because I know the battle is raging in this nation. And, oh, Lord, I want us to step forward in victory and to go forward in the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so I plead your blood. I plead your help. I plead your understanding this morning. God, that we would understand this invisible war and that we would see how to counter it by prayer and the love of Christ. Oh, Lord, we need you right now as we worship you through the study of your word. Be with us, we pray, in Jesus' name. And God's people said, Amen. Chapters 10 through 12 record the last revelation that God gives to Daniel. Chapter 10 is kind of the preface. It is telling us how the vision came to Daniel. Tonight we'll study chapter 11, which tells us a very lengthy message that God wanted Daniel to know. And then chapter 12 we'll study next week. That will give us the postscript, the conclusion of the book. Now verse 1 serves as kind of an introduction to let us know when this message was going on, when the battle was happening. So you'll notice it happens in the third year of King Cyrus, the year 536 B.C. Now, this wasn't the third year Cyrus had been the king of Medo-Persia. We know from history that Cyrus had long been the king of Medo-Persia. But in the year 539, Cyrus had come and conquered the Babylonian Empire. Three years later, 536 B.C. is when this vision is being given to Daniel. Daniel says, this message was revealed unto me. It was something God only knew, and if it had not been revealed, we wouldn't know it today. We wouldn't even have a clue about what was going on. By the way, it's important to note that when this message is given, two years have passed since Cyrus made a decree that the Jewish people who had been in Babylon for 70 years can now go back to the land. God promised that they would only be in bondage 70 years and they would have freedom to return. God's word is true. They've been going back the last two years. Daniel receives this message two years later. The message is true. Now, every word of Scripture is true, but this is such an amazing message. He feels compelled to tell those who are reading it, look, I'm not making this up. 
This stuff isn't something like some delusion from my head. This isn't a false vision or an empty conjecture. This is the Word of God. It can be depended on. You can read these words and feel like they were spoken from heaven and they were given to you this very morning. By the way, he says, I had understanding of this vision. In contrast to the earlier visions, some of them he did not understand. But this one, he gets. He understands it. And I think we can too. Now look at the context in verses 2 and 3. Daniel says, in those days I was mourning three full weeks. I didn't eat any pleasant food. I didn't eat meat, wine. None of them came to my mouth. I didn't anoint myself at all till three whole weeks were fulfilled. Now, we've got to stop there for a minute and realize something. If Daniel was a normal, selfish person, he would have no reason to be mourning as he writes these words. You see, Daniel 1.21 tells us he's already retired from public service. He retired two years earlier after the first year Cyrus reigned. Josephus tells us, the Jewish historian says that because the Medes and Persians were so impressed with Daniel and he was so helpful in that first year they had taken over Babylon, the government built him his own private castle, his own private tower on the bank of the Tigris River in Media. So Daniel's retired. He has a beautiful home in one of the most beautiful spots in all of the kingdom. He has everything furnished that the king's treasury could buy. He's in what we would call the perfect retirement situation. Now this text does not say on what account he's troubled, why he's upset, why he's mourning. But friends, the book has told us over and over again why he's upset. And we can have little doubt the reason why is on the account of his people. You see, Daniel is expressing his sympathy and devotion because his people, the Jewish people, are an afflicted people. He is broken for the suffering of his people, for the sins of his people, for the sorrows of his people. He is sad the Jewish people have liberty to return to the land of Israel, and yet they continue to stay captive in Babylon. They're enjoying their captivity more than the freedom God has offered them. He is bothered that Jerusalem, God's city, the temple is still essentially in ruins and the land barren and desolate. He is broken in heart about this. He has all the physical things you could ever want, but that's not enough with the man of God. Christians don't live for physical things as much as they live for things that last forever. You know, when I read these words, he was mourning three full weeks i got to tell you, i got to give you my heart on the things that I am broken for. The things that make me want to be a pastor. I'm a pastor, first and foremost, because I love God's Word. I want to declare God's Word. I want people to understand God's Word. But let me tell you something. This county is not the easiest place to be a pastor at. Did you know that? It's really not. And yet there is a reason why God has me here. There's a reason why my heart beats like it does and my mind is running in the direction it's going and my heart is taking me when I believe our church on this very same journey. I am broken. I am mourning like Daniel because of the crime in our county. Did you know violent and property crimes are increasing? I looked up the statistics yesterday. I've given you the 2009 statistics. Let me give you 2010. They're out now. Violent crime rate for Pensacola was higher than the national average by 94.57% in our city. The city property crime rate was higher than the national average by 61.77%. In 2010, there were 269 aggravated assaults, 4 cases of arson, 519 cases of burglary, 36 forcible rapes, 1,939 cases of larceny and theft, 87 motor vehicle thefts, 3 murders and manslaughters, 112 robberies, 2,545 property crimes, 420 violent crimes. Daniel was broken for his nation because they were hurting. And I have to tell you, I am broken for our city because it's hurting. I am broken for the kids that are growing up in Escambia County in 2012. I am broken because over 25% of our population is below the poverty level and is relying on the government to exist. I am broken because Escambia County is the second poorest county in the state of Florida and that 33% of our children are below 
below the poverty level in this county. I am broken for the 2,000 babies a year that are aborted in Escambia County. Where are the people broken for the hundreds of kids who walked on the property this Wednesday night at Light the Night? Kids whom God made, God loves, and yet they don't know Jesus. Are you mourning about that? Are you broken for your people? Are you broken for the place God has put you in? Who's broken for all those cars that sit in their driveways on Sunday morning while you head to church? Look, I'm broken for some of our church members who don't take the worship of God seriously. And there's plenty of them that don't. Just look around at all the empty spots. If our church members alone showed up, we'd have to build another building on a Sunday morning. That's the reality, isn't it? That's not funny, is it? That is, we don't have our affections on God like we should. Do you agree when you read this that we should be bothered when you hear these things? Who is bothered for a nation, the United States of America, that has clearly rejected the Lordship of Jesus Christ, whose leaders call evil good and call good evil? I am bothered by that. I mourn that. Do you agree that God's heart is broken for all these things? I think God is upset. I think He is saddened by the pain in this county. I think His God is bothered by it. And we can either just hide in our little churches and beat our doctrinal selves to death, or we can care like Jesus does and live the words of God and make a difference as light. Ask for God's heart. If you're not mourning and broken about these things, ask for God's heart and He'll open your eyes and ears to hear and see and you will be broken. Oswald Chambers said, If through a broken heart God can bring His purposes to pass in this world, then thank Him for breaking your heart. Oh God, break our hearts to what we see around us like Daniel. I can imagine Daniel was saddened because the Jews had been in Israel two years. They were allowed to build the temple, and yet we are told in the book of Ezra chapter 4 that the enemies of Israel made the Jews afraid to build by hiring counselors against them to frustrate their purposes. And so the temple was in ruins. The worship of God was in ruins. And I am bothered that people don't take God seriously. You know why they don't take Him seriously? Because what we are known for as Christians in Pensacola is angry people who slap the Bible in people's faces instead of loving them with the Bible. We are known for angry people screaming at cars in full suits that are going 40 miles per hour rather than having conversations like the apostles did and proclaiming the truth of Jesus Christ. We are known for all the wrong things. We are known for all the wrong things. Matthew Henry has said, Good men cannot but mourn to see how slowly the work of God is going on in the world and what opposition it meets with and how weak its friends are and how active its enemies are. Daniel was mourning, and I am mourning because of the situation we find ourselves in. So we are told he ate no pleasant food. He didn't anoint himself. This was a partial fast. By the way, it's hard to fast when you're young. It's a lot harder to do this when you're in your 80s. Late 80s, probably Daniel's in. But he is so broken, he wants to show God his heart. And so we read here, he abstains from meat, he abstains from wine, he abstains from the good, the pleasant bread. He's eating just enough to make him survive. He's only drinking water. He abstains from lotions and oils that would make life comfortable in a dry desert climate because he takes all that time he would have spent eating and drinking and putting lotion on. Every time he was afflicted those three weeks, he was spent it praying before God, seeking God's face for the brokenness of his people. Instead of eating and anointing, he was bearing his heart to God. And I would tell you today, if people would just spend one-tenth of the time they waste on Facebook and they waste slandering politicians just praying for our nation and our families and our church and our children, oh, how God would move. Just one-tenth of the time we waste. Now, verse 4, On the fourth day of the first month, as I was by the side of the great river Tigris, I lifted up my eyes, I looked, and behold, a certain man was there. This man was clothed in linen. His waist was girded with the gold of Uphaz. His body was like beryl, his face like the appearance of lightning, his eyes like torches of fire, his arms and feet 
like burnished bronze in color, and the sound of his words like the voice of a multitude. Now, Daniel's there in person. He's got people with him. And all of a sudden, he sees something that rocks his world. A certain man shows up. Now, this appearance of this man clearly means he's not just a man. This is a supernatural being, a heavenly being, an angel. And by the way, when you read in the Bible over and over again, when angels appear to us, they appear to us in a human type of form, but there's always something dramatically different about them. And that's exactly what we read here. Look at the description of this angel that shows up and appears to Daniel. It says, he is clothed in linen, a symbol of purity, holiness, no sin. This is a good angel, one that has not fallen and followed Satan. We know the high priest wore linen on the Day of Atonement. In Ezekiel 9, the prophet there saw angels wearing linen. Secondly, his waist is girded with the gold of Uphaz. Uphaz was a place in Arabia where the finest and purest of gold in the world was mined. Just beautiful gold on his body. His body, I don't know if this is his skin or what, but it was like beryl, which was a precious stone that was kind of a sky color, like an emerald. His body had this color to it. His face had the appearance of lightning, exceeding bright, especially on a dark night. His countenance, you just look at him. It's so dazzling to the eye, like lightning. It's majestic and powerful. It brightens and yet it threatens you all at once. His eyes are as torches of fire, piercing and penetrating the one who looks at him, telling you your real condition of your heart. Have you ever had someone look at you and you knew they could see right through you? That's exactly what's going on here. His arms and his feet like burnished bronze. Great strength, stability, firmness. This angel's not going anywhere. And then the sound of his words like the voice of a multitude. His voice had gravity. It could overpower a multitude. It was so loud and strong. One of God's very angels and his glory. Though it is veiled, it is just shining through this mighty creature, overwhelming the people around Daniel, crushing Daniel to the ground. This is the beginning of the spiritual war that we see. We see this warrior who is involved in it. Verse 7, Daniel says, I alone saw this vision, because the men who were with me did not see the vision, but a great terror fell upon them, and they fled to hide themselves. In other words, there was a divine influence which everyone there felt. But the companions of Daniel who were with him, they fled to hide. A sensation of dread, the holiness of God was there. And dread came upon them so strongly. Maybe they fled to hide in Daniel's home where they fled to hide behind the trees on the Tigris River. Just like Adam hid from God among the trees of the garden. This is like when Saul was on the road to Damascus. You remember that story when Jesus Christ, the glorified Christ, appeared to Saul. His companions could hear the voice from heaven, but they saw nothing. Their eyes were not allowed to see Jesus. You know, I think there's a lesson in that for us. This reminds us that we can come close to the presence, to the power of God. And yet we can miss the message through the lack of spiritual perception. People come to church all the time and the glory of God comes down. But if you don't have eyes to see and ears to hear, you will hide from the glory of God. And I'm convinced that one way many people hide is by dozing off. So they don't have to hear what is being said. I'm also convinced a lot of people hide from the glory of God by thinking just about everything they can think of rather than the word of God that is being opened to them. Because they can't hide physically, they'll hide other ways. Or they'll hide by just not coming. So these guys hide. By the way, this also reminds us of something else, something much more grave than that. Every unsaved person in the world will one day have to look, not upon the glory of an angel, but the very glory of God revealed in His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. As He appeared to Paul, as this angel appeared to these men, every unsaved person will one day stand before the throne of God and they will tremble and quake with fear, but they will have no way to hide on that day. It's another reason why I'm broken for Escambia County. We may be the Bible Belt, but there are people all around us that do not know Jesus. And Christians have put too many obstacles in their way. We're not called to put obstacles in their way. We're called to share the good news and to love them. 
Look, we need to keep reevaluating our church. What obstacles are we putting out there? The only obstacle we need to put out is the truth of the gospel. It's good news. It will either convert you or it will condemn you. But we don't need to put man-made traditions and regulations that will stop people from loving Jesus and knowing Jesus. So these guys, they flee. They hide. Here's the battle. Therefore I was left alone. And I saw this great vision. No strength remained in me. My vigor was turned to frailty in me. I retained no strength. I heard the sound of his words, and when I heard the sound of his words, I was in a deep sleep on my face, with my face to the ground. And suddenly a hand touched me, which made me tremble on my knees and on the palms of my hands. And he said to me, O Daniel, greatly beloved, man greatly beloved, understand the words that I speak to you. Stand upright, for I have now been sent to you. While he was speaking this word to me, I stood trembling. And he said to me, Do not fear, Daniel, for from the first day you set your heart to understand and to humble yourself before your God, your words were heard. And I have come because of your words. I want you to see here that Daniel was struck by the overwhelming trauma of the presence of God. It was like trauma to the extreme to be in the presence of a holy God, which, by the way, teaches us even the godliest of men and women fall short of the glory of God. Daniel was a man who loved God. He was a spiritual giant, and yet he lost all appearance and strength in the presence of one of God's holy angels. And then a hand touched him. Unless God touches us, we will never rise up. We will never rise up. This man said to Daniel, listen, Daniel, your prayers have been heard. You are a man greatly beloved of God. Look, nothing is more powerful and effectual to revive a broken spirit than to declare the love of God. Nothing is more wonderful than to be assured of God's love. Those are greatly beloved who God loves. This is the second time Daniel has been told this. Daniel 9.23 was the first time. God loves us not because we are good, but because He is good. I want to assure you today of that. God's love is real. Romans 5.8 God demonstrates His love towards us, towards you. Towards Escambia County, where all this pain and suffering is. And that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Jesus loves America not because we're good. We're a mess. He loves us because He is good. One day, Charles Spurgeon was walking through the English countryside with a friend. And as they strolled along, Spurgeon noticed a barn. And on top of the barn was a metal weather vane. And this weather vane said, God is love. Spurgeon remarked to his friend that he thought this was a rather inappropriate place for such a message. Because weather veins are changeable, Spurgeon said, but God's love is constant. I don't agree, said his friend to Spurgeon. You misunderstand the meaning, Charles. By the way, you took a lot of guts to tell Spurgeon he's wrong. He said, Charles, that sign is indicating a truth. Regardless of the way which the wind blows, God is love. It's true. It's out there. His love is real. Friends, Daniel says here, I stood trembling. But yet, this angel says, do not fear, Daniel. Do not fear. You know, I think of Jesus and walking on the water and his disciples were were so broken by the storm, and they they feared as He came in Mark chapter 6, and He said in that very traumatic of circumstances, Be of good cheer. It is I. Be not afraid. Do not be alarmed at My presence. As dreadful as the glory of God is to a sinner, how wonderful the love of God is. Do not fear. For the first day you set your heart, your words were heard. Daniel had been praying and doing this partial fast 21 days because he loved his people. Like we are called to love our people and love our families. And my friends, he is assuring him here, I have heard your prayers those 21 days. There may have been a delay to prayer, but it was delayed to the answer of prayer, but it was heard by God immediately. Let me read you what the Presbyterian pastor Albert Barnes says here. He said, In our deepest days of anxiety and trouble, when our prayers do not seem to penetrate the skies of heaven, when the thing which we pray for seems to be withheld from us, when our friends remain unconverted who are praying for their salvation, when irreligion abounds everywhere, 
When we seem to be doing no good. I don't know if you ever feel that way, but I feel it almost every day. Like everything I do matters nothing. If we saw the arrangement which God was already making to answer the prayer, and we could see the messenger on his way, our hearts would exalt, our tears would cease to flow. Even though the delay may seem to be long, God will show himself to be a hearer and an answerer of your prayer. 21 days, but God is on the throne still. Verses 13 through 15. He says this is the reason why. The invisible war that was going on is the reason why it took 21 days for me to come here. The prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me 21 days. And behold, Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me, for I had been left alone there with the kings of Persia. Now I have come to make you understand what will happen to your people in the latter days, for the vision refers to many days yet to come. When he had spoken these words to me, I turned my face toward the ground and became speechless. Now, here's the invisible war. The prince of the king of Persia opposed him. This can't be understood to mean the literal king of Persia, Cyrus. This can't be talking about Cyrus' son. An earthly king can't oppose a heavenly angel. It's not possible. This prince was able to oppose the angelic messenger to Daniel, sent by the very throne of God. So we know something here. We know this is more than a man. It's an evil angelic being. Let me remind you the words of the Apostle Paul in Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 through 12. Paul says there, Be strong in the Lord and in the strength of His might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. And why? Because we do not wrestle against flesh and blood. We wrestle against rulers against authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, over the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Friends, there was this battle going on in heaven between this angel who came to Daniel and this other angel who was in charge of Persia, the prince of Persia. By the way, didn't Jesus say of Satan three different times that Satan was the what? The prince of this world? See, Satan has rulers and authorities and powers. He has a hierarchy of angels, just like God is the Lord of hosts, the Lord of armies. And he has angelic armies. Satan has angelic armies too that are fallen angels, demons. This angel was a high-ranking evil angel anointed by Satan to oppose and thwart the work of God in Persia. Do you believe that there are demonic angels trying to stop the work of God in America? Do you believe there are demonic angels trying to stop the work of God in Pensacola? Demonic angels trying to stop the work of God at Klondike Baptist Church? There are. 1 Corinthians 11 tells us there's good angels that are at the church. Why are there good angels here? There's angels in our midst as we worship today, according to 1 Corinthians 11. You know why? Because there are evil angels trying to stop the work of God in your heart in this city. Do you not believe that there are evil angels that would seek to hurt your family? Or even to hurt you personally. Look, the battle is real. We are not told much about the spirit world in the Bible. But what we see, the glimpses we see, we need to know. We know Satan rebelled against God because of pride in his heart. He fell. And at that time, a vast host of angels fell with him. Revelation 12 gives a picture of one third of all the angels falling with Satan, rejecting the Godship of God, opposing God's rule. The number of this great host of evil angels can be gauged from the fact that Mary Magdalene herself was possessed with seven demons. We're told that in Mark 16 and Luke 8. With the story of the man of Gadara in Luke chapter 8 and in the Gospel of Matthew, a full legion of demons were in him. 6,826 men made up a Roman legion. And so if he was using that term, there were thousands of demons in one man. The Bible tells us there are myriads and myriads of angels. That means an innumerable amount. No one knows what a myriad is. And if one third of myriads fell with Satan, there are many demonic forces out there in this world opposing God. My friends, these are intelligent beings with the power to hurt man physically, control him mentally and morally. You know, there's many jokes out there in the world today about the devil. I think most of them are inspired by the devil himself to make us take him lightly and lower our guard. But the devil is no lightweight. He is evil, he is real, and he is personal. 
He and his angels engage in heavenly warfare to influence generations and nations against God and his people. This demon of high rank was assigned to influence the empire of Medo-Persia. And he opposed God's message answering Daniel's prayer. This angel says, he withstood me. He resisted me 21 days. There is an invisible war going on. And look, we can only battle it when we are close to Christ. This war is to ruin your kids. Ruin your grandchildren. Destroy this church. Destroy this city. Destroy this nation. Corey Ten Boom said, When a Christian shuns fellowship with other Christians, the devil smiles. There is nothing but sin itself that should separate Christians from one another. Even if we differ on doctrines, we should still love one another and be one under the blood of Jesus. Corey Ten Boom said, When Satan stops us from studying the Bible, the devil laughs. When Satan stops us from praying, the devil shouts for joy. Thomas Brooks, the Puritan writer, said, Satan will promise you the best, but he will pay with the worst. He will promise you honor, and he will pay with disgrace. He will promise you pleasure, and he will pay you with pain. He will promise you profit, and he will pay with loss. He will promise you life, and he will pay with death. And I will say, Satan has really fooled thousands of Christians all throughout this world because they're fighting the wrong battle. Our battle is the gospel. Our battle is seeing lives changed and influenced by the gospel, making disciples, changing lives, changing hearts, bringing his kingdom on earth as it is in heaven. Where did we get so off track? That's why Satan has such pull over our families and our homes. Now friends, I have to say this before I close. God could have crushed this evil angel's opposition immediately. Immediately. God is God. The devil is still God's devil. God had a sovereign purpose to allow this battle to go on 21 days in heaven. Just like God had a sovereign purpose to allow His Son to be tempted by the devil. Those 40 days in the wilderness. You see, you've got to understand something. Satan is not a counterpart to God. He may be a counterpart to Michael and to Gabriel, but he is not a counterpart to the Lord. Satan is limited. He is finite. God is unlimited. He is infinite. God is omnipotent, all-powerful. Satan is not. God is sovereign and can do as He pleases. Satan can do nothing without God's approval and permission. The universe was created by God, is upheld by God, is owned by God, not by Satan. Satan doesn't even own hell. Satan will be a tenant of hell. He is not the owner of hell running around with a pitchfork like the cartoons would like you to believe. God is omniscient. He knows everything. This is untrue of Satan. He is a good guesser, but that's it. God is omnipresent everywhere at once. Satan can only be in one place at a time. We only know in the Bible of six individuals who were tempted by Satan himself. Eve, Job, Jesus, Judas, Peter, and Ananias. No doubt there were many others, but only those six were tempted by him. We only know of three people who were possessed by Satan himself. Judas, the king of Babylon in Isaiah 14, and the king of Tyre in Ezekiel 28. That is it. We are told in Job that Satan and his fallen angels will challenge God to take away Job's possessions and health, seeking to make Job fall. But that's all he can do is seek God's permission to attack us. In Zechariah chapter 3, we read about Satan accusing the high priest of Israel at that time, Joshua. Just small glimpses into what Satan does. This war is going on. Satan is attacking our families and our homes. And sometimes God allows that. But there is a reason for it. And the reason was what we read here. It happened for 21 days. And let me ask you, did Daniel persevere those 21 days? It happens because God is training us to make us stronger. It happens because God wants us to be persistent. God ended that battle by sending Michael the archangel. By the way, just like Satan had a prince angel over Persia, God has a prince angel over Israel, and his name is Michael the archangel. And he watches over Israel all the time in Scripture. Daniel is overwhelmed by this. He falls to the ground again. He just can't believe it. He's overwhelmed at this battle he's heard about. You should be overwhelmed that God loves you so much that He sent His Son to end the battle one day. 
There was no breath left in him. This ends in verse 18 through 20. Then again, the one having the likeness of a man touched me. He strengthened me. He said, oh man, greatly beloved, fear not. Peace be to you. Be strong, be strong. And when he spoke to me, I was strengthened and said, let my Lord speak for you have strengthened me. He said, do you not know why I have come to you? I will now return to fight with the prince of Persia. When I have gone, the prince, gone, then the prince of Greece. But I will tell you what is noted in the scripture of truth. No one upholds me against these except Michael, your prince. Fear not. You have nothing to fear if you're beloved of God. You don't have to fear Satan. Do you understand that? You don't have to fear him, but you have to be aware of him. Be strong in the Lord. To those who have no might, God will increase your strength. If you're under attack today, stop trying to win the battle on your own. Be strong in the Lord. Friends, I, as I close, I'm reminded of a story that I read in Ray Stedman's book called Spiritual Warfare. It was a warm, quiet Sunday morning on the Hawaiian island. The date was December 7th, 1941. There were no enemies in sight on that Hawaiian island. Out of the clear blue sky, which was just invisible to enemies, out of nowhere, swarms of aircraft descended out. All of a sudden, Pearl Harbor had ships erupting into flames and billows of oily black smoke. And within those ships, men died without a moment's warning. Many still asleep on their bunks. Aboard one cruiser, the USS New Orleans, there was a lieutenant and chaplain named Hal M. Forgey. And he got a group of crewmen to break into a locked ammunition storeroom so the ship could mount a defense. Once Chaplain Forgey and the other men got inside, they discovered the ammunition hoist was broken. It was out of commission. So Chaplain Forgey and the other men formed a human chain like a bucket brigade, passing the heavy artillery shells from one man to the other up the gun deck. The shells were heavy and the work was hard. It had to be carried on amid the smells of smoke, the sounds of human screams and roaring planes and exploding bombs. A minute ago it was an invisible clear day, and all of a sudden the battle was raging. Chaplain Forgey saw some of the men's arms weakening, their faces showing signs of hopelessness in the midst of the battle. Kind of like some of us are weak this morning. We're tired. I'm tired. So he slapped the back of the man next to him and he shouted these infamous words, Praise the Lord and pass the ammunition. The story was later retold. The chaplain's words became the opening lines of that popular wartime song. Praise the Lord and pass the ammunition. Friends, you and I face much the same situation today. We are under heavy attack, spiritual, moral attack. We should be broken for our city, broken for our kids and our grandkids and our families, broken for our society and our government and our universities, broken for our churches and our lives. There are wounded people all around us, and to survive and win, we must stand in the strength of the Lord, we must praise the Lord, and we must pass the ammunition. We need to be broken and trust that Jesus has already won the victory. Colossians 2.15 says, He disarmed the rulers, the authorities. He put them to open shame. He will triumph over them. If you are battling today, if you feel like the war is almost over for you, remember, we know the end of the story. God is on the throne. And He will win. And your family can win too. And you can win with Jesus Christ as your God. Let us pray. Oh, Father, thank you for your love. Oh, God, I pray we would take seriously this invisible war that is raging over our nation, over our church, over our city, maybe even over our very own lives. And our God, I pray that we would love you and fight on because you are worthy. Be with us now as we worship you in this song and as we pray together as the people of God. Have the victory, we ask in Jesus' name. God's people said, Amen. Friend, this is Joshua Walnofer, pastor of Klondike Baptist. And I want to thank you for taking the time to listen to this sermon today. If we can be of any help to you, 
answer any questions about the Bible, or talk more with you about the salvation provided by the mighty hand of Christ Jesus, feel free to contact us by any of the methods mentioned on our church website. If you would like to share a testimony of how God's Word has transformed your life, please write and let us know. We'd love to hear from you. And remember, Jesus said, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. And I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall anyone pluck them out of my hand.